Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Father, in the name that's above every other name, we give you thanks and praise. Thank you for the work you are doing in our lives. Thank you for the work you are doing in our nations. Lord, we pray that your spiritual instructors and bring us to the fullness of understanding of how you want us to complete this mission of discipling nations. Lord, I pray this for every individual in this place and every leader and every marketplace person every family person that all of us may go and bear fruit and our fruit may remain to you Lord we return glory and honor in Jesus Christ our Lord Amen. Amen. I want to share something and uh, God help me make it as brief as possible. Let's go to the book of Acts. Chapter 6. And I'll read from verse 1 to verse 8. No, 7. Now in those days when the number of disciples was multiplying there no oh, sorry I'm reading from Acts chapter 5 from verse 12 to verse 16 and through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Multitudes of both men and women. So that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and coaches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Someone say amen. This is the picture that the Bible is painting for us of that church mega church that was in Jerusalem. Now remember Jesus told the apostles first in Jerusalem then in Judea then in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So there was a time when the church was only in Jerusalem and it was only one congregation led by the apostles who were also led by Peter with James and John. I want us to look at that picture you know, from the very first day I was sharing with you, I, I said, revival 
is the restoration of that which was which got lost and you work to bring it back. And we said the best picture of revival of that which was is the picture in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. The picture of God's creation before sin entered into the picture. And man had not yet rebelled against God. And God looked at what he had created and said, Behold, it is good. It was a perfect world. It was exactly as God intended it to be. It was according to his plan. And God looked at it and said, Behold, it is good. So we say the best picture for all of us to put in our hearts as we pray and seek God for revival is that picture. Because that's the most perfect picture of God's kingdom that we see in the Bible. Now, having dealt with that, let us also look at the picture of pursuing the Great Commission. The most perfect we see in the scriptures. And that was in Jerusalem. The church had not yet spread out to other territories. The church was one. Like Jesus prayed and said that they may be one. That the world may believe. And they were full of love to the point that no one lacked anything. People sold their property and brought the money at the feet of the apostles. And the apostles made sure they met all the needs of the people of God. So it was a, a picture of perfect love. A picture of v vigilant evangelism. A picture of power, signs and wonders. A picture of the unity of the body of Christ. A picture of the glory of God. To the point that the non-believers dared not to come among the believers. The believers would gather together in Solomon's porch and the glory of God was with them such that the non-believers dared not to join them. But when they finished their fellowship, and went out into the streets, then everybody followed them. And they brought all their sick people and put them along the road. Perchance the shadow of Peter would go over them. And as many as the shadow touched, they were healed. Well, he deserves the glory, doesn't he? It is a picture of the church 
that many people have never bothered to examine. It was beautiful. It was full of good report. It was exemplary. If you are praying for revival, that is the picture to pray for. That we may again be a church with a testimony like we see in Acts chapter 5. What was unique about this picture? One, it had a specific territory. According to the instructions of the Lord, first Jerusalem. So they were engaging Jerusalem. And that is a biblical principle of the Great Commission. And then they were one. Like Jesus prayed for the church. They were one and of one accord. And then they were full of love. Because love is the power of God. And then they, they were preaching the gospel. Not only the apostles. But every believer was going out in the streets witnessing for Jesus. And at home, all of them broke bread. Breaking bread was not the work of only pastors. It was the work of every believer. They all had that priestly understanding. Amen? And the miracles, the signs, and the wonders took place. Have you ever tried to take that picture and impose it upon your village? Your district. Most people would just say, ah, forget it. But why? Why forget it? Let us look at a number of elements. One. Your district is a clear geographical demarcation. Or your town. Or your town. Or your village. Or your neighborhood. Like Greater Katale is. When I asked Pastor Godfrey, how many people are in Greater Katale? He did not know. Okay. How many churches are in Greater Katari? He did not know. Okay. How many non believers are in Greater Katari? He did not know. Then what is your work? Discipling territories or nations. Which nation? What is discipling a nation? I remember when I met pastors last year in, uh, is it the Set the Pace conference? And I asked them, how many pastors have been in your area? Maybe in Tebe, maybe Kawempe, maybe Masaka. You have been there for 20 years. And several of them raised their hands. Several of them raised their hands. I said, fine. Let us ask another question. Who took you there? 
Why are you there? Do you have the assurance in your heart that it is God who took you there? Because if you don't have that assurance, pack your bags and go where you came from. What are you doing there? But if you have assurance that God took you there, it doesn't have to be a prophetic word. Amen. It could just be conviction of your heart. You are convinced in your heart that you are in the right place at the right time. Amen. Let us stick that. Let us assume that it is God's will that you are in that territory. Then why are you there? We could turn that question around and say, why are you alive on earth? What is your mission on earth? What are you doing on earth? What are you doing in your territory? Are you just consuming other people's oxygen? If you are there for a purpose, what is that purpose? Someone will say, Oh, my life mission is to take care of orphans. Oh, for me, my life, is, my life mission is to deal with the youth. Oh, for me, my life mission is to deal with the homeless. And many people allow those differences to separate us. If you take all those life missions and put them together, you can summarize them into discipling nations. Which means, you know, Jesus came to do what? to destroy the works of the devil. The devil does not come but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So some of us have been anointed to intervene among orphans, to intervene among the homeless, to inter intervene among the drug addicts, to intervene among the prostitutes. But what does that mean? You are destroying the works of the devil. And you are taking communities from darkness to the kingdom of light. All visions and all missions culminate in one. The Great Commission. Amen. Amen. So when I was in Taiwan, and I was showing them the roadmap to see God move in the country, their first response was, we all have our own visions and we are all too busy we cannot do that I remember even there was a time we met here with pastors here prayer mountain and that was the general response but you want us to do that but we all have our callings and our visions. I remember I asked here, we were standing there. I said, what is the end result of your vision? And what is the end result of your vision? What is the end result of your vision? Unfortunately, many did not answer. 
But it, the end result is the same. Whatever you do, we are waiting for the day he will come back and take us home. And the difference between those who will not go and those who will go is salvation. Great commission. Hey, I can feel the tension. Am I stepping on your feet? Let me try to make it a little bit soft. Let us assume that you are in your territory for a purpose. And you believe that God is the one who sent you. And you are working hard. You have been working for the last 10, 20 years. Now I want to correct one notion that many people get wrong. Many church leaders in their mind they think they have been called by God to build their ministries. So they are focused, how do I build this congregation? How do I grow the congregation? How do I increase the number of the congregation? How do I increase programs in my congregation? But that is not the Great Commission. The Great Commission is go make disciples of nations. And how do we do that? Territory by territory. In other words, our presence in any territory should result in a progressive change of that territory from darkness to light. The measure of your impact is not in how big a congregation you have. It is in the impact you have on society. It is in fulfillment of the prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let your kingdom come. And let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So if you ask a leader, how long have you been in this territory? Says, 20 years. Okay. When you came, what was the state of darkness in the territory? And after 10 years, what was the degree of change? And now, how much change have you been able to effect from darkness to light? Kuchuka chuka kwenkana wa kote kole sewo okuva mchizikiza okuda mchitangara. Amen. And if you are aware of that picture, how much more is not yet impacted? And if you know how much more, how much is not yet impacted? How long do you need to finish the work? You know, in the year 2001, I was praying about 
reopening the churches after, after the lockdowns. <laughs> and I was praying, Lord, we don't want to just go do whatever we want. What do you want us to do? What do you want us to go resume or to start with? And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he said, that is always your desire. You love doing the will of God. And he gave me a scripture. John chapter 4 verse 34. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of my Father who sent me and to finish his work. So the Holy Spirit asked me, you love to do the will of God. There's no problem with that. But when are you finishing? Why is it that you never pray about finishing? And I had never thought of that. Finishing? I thought my work will be finished. When my work is finished, he will call me to go home. I'll die and go home. Oh, he will come back for us. And the Holy Spirit showed me, do you have a desire to walk like Jesus walked? I said, yes, Lord, I want to be like Jesus. His food was to do the will of the Father and to finish the work. Do you want to be like that? Amen. Amen. Do you know that the day came when Jesus said, Father, I have glorified you by finishing the work you sent me to do. And the Holy Spirit asked me another question. Do you know what your finished work looks like? Can you recognize it when you see it? And if you don't know what it looks like, how will you know that you are finished? Jesus knew. He said, Father, I have finished. How do I know? The people you gave me, I have given them everything you gave me. And they have believed it. They were yours. You gave them to me. And I have kept them. And now, as you sent me into the world, I am sending them. Did Jesus know how the finished work looks like? Yes, what about us? If you have been in your territory, let's say in Tebe, for 20 years, what is in Tebe supposed to look like when you are finished with it? Was Jesus unique? What about Paul? In the book of Acts, chapter 20, I think verse 20, he said, everywhere I go, I am hearing these words that I'm going to Jerusalem and they are going to take hold of me. But this does not affect me. For I don't care what they do with my life. All I want is to finish my rest with joy. Amen. He was not just working every day, waking up every year, starting a new year. 
You know, every year, happy new year, happy new year. But do you pause and say, hey? Paul said, for me, I don't care what happens to me. All I want is to finish my rest. And when you want to finish your rest, you don't just live randomly. Let me show you what Paul lived like. He said, I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews, circumcised on the seventh day, according to the righteousness that comes from the law, perfect. He, I, I can assess my life. I know what my life is like. But whatever was of profit to me, I called loss that I may win Christ. Not only that, I called everything loss that I may have the righteousness that does not come from the law but that which comes of the faith of Jesus. The righteousness that is of the Father. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection being conformed even unto his sufferings. If only I may be part of the resurrection. I'm not saying that I'm already perfected. But forgetting what is behind, I reach towards the end mark. That is the discipline of a person wanting to finish well. And he said, I want to lay hold of that for which Jesus laid hold of me. What about you? Why are you alive? Why are you waking up every day? Why do you eat every day? Paul said, for me, I have a reason. I want to lay hold of that for which Jesus laid hold of me. Ho, ho. Then one day, this Paul said, I have run the race. I have fought a good fight. I have finished and I have kept the faith. I am done. I'm finished. I know there is a crown waiting for me. Wow. He is a man who has lived his life purposefully. Purposefully. And he was pursuing a certain end. And when he got to that end, he said, Hell. Amen. I have run the good race. I have fought the good fight. I have finished. And I have kept the faith. Now I'm going home. I know there's a crown waiting for me. But not only for me, but all those who love the righteousness of God. What about Peter? Peter said in his letter, I'm about to put off this heart, meaning his body. But before I go, I want to remind you these things which I taught you already. What was he saying? My time is up. I'm about to go. But I'm thinking about you. I'm concerned for you. I want to be sure you are going to be faithful to what I taught you. 
Now, let me see those who have got my book. Today, I was sitting with one of the guys, the gentlemen who worked on printing it and making it ready. And he said to me, Doctor, are you planning more books like this? I said, oh, read down here. It's the first book in the series, Finishing with Anna. And he said, you know, I, when I read that, I was very worried. When a spiritual father is talking about finishing with Anna, you get you start worrying. Banange, is it you to worry about the father going or the father should worry about you staying? The day you know you've finished, you don't want another day on earth. <laughs> you don't want any other thing in the world. I was reading the story of uh, David Brainerd. He labored among the Red Indians in America. And a time came he knew his time is over. He called his brother John Brainerd and said, come, take, take over the work. Then he went to his friend, Jonathan Edwards, and said, Jonathan, pray for me to go home. I am done. And Jonathan said, wait a moment. I'm going to have to write you, go to download. Everything you learned when you are still on earth. You can't go with it. We have got to record. So every day, from morning to evening, yes, Talk, 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 talk. And every day, David would say to Jonathan, please let me go. And Jonathan said, no way. No way. Download. <laughs> and the day Jonathan felt it was all over, he said, now you can go in peace. And that night, David went home. Do we know why we are here? Ask your neighbor, do you know why you are here? What are you doing on earth? Let me summarize this. Let us say I am in Entebbe. And I wake up one day and say, why am I in Entebbe? Because, because God sent me to Entebbe. If I really believe God sent me to Entebbe, do I also believe what the Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, it says, the whole world is in the sway of the wicked one. Because the whole world is in the control of the wicked one, that is why the Father wants us to disciple nations to get the nations out of the control of the wicked one into his kingdom. So when he sends, sends me to Entebbe, now especially pastors, please listen to me. God has sent me to Entebbe. What does he want? What is his real desire? 
to see my church grow big or to see my impact on Entebbe grow big. Entebbe is in the control of the wicked one. He has sent me into Entebbe. He calls me his ambassador. So what does he want? A healthy, good, smart church. All he wants impact on Entebbe. If I am in Entebbe for 10 years, and my impact is still the same as it was in the beginning. Am I really serving the kingdom of God? Do you know how many pastors, church leaders, ministers are not serving the kingdom of God? But they are fighting every day to build their congregation. And they are fighting, telling the church, the sheep, don't go there. Those are wrong. Those are false. Stay here, stay here, stay here. Stay here to do what? Bible says you pastor, you apostle, you prophet, you evangelist. Your work is to equip us, the saints, to go out and do the work of ministry. But you are telling us stay here, stay here, stay here. I am going to feed you. And I'm going I'm to pray for you. But how long are we going to pray for people? When will you teach them how to pray for themselves? When will you teach them to hear God for themselves? Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. But a pastor who doesn't understand the Great Commission tells the sheep, come, I will hear for you. I will tell you what God is saying to you. And I'm, I'm not attacking pastors here. I'm talking about the Great Commission. Jesus said, yes, Matthew Madam. chapter 13, verse 19, if a person hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil comes and steals it from him. So, if God has sent me into Entebbe, it means he wants to see the darkness defeated. He wants to see the lost one to the kingdom. He wants to see his kingdom come and his will done in Entebbe as it is in heaven. Now let me tell you something. <laughs> Many of us pastors are only looking at the programs inside our congregations. To in a prayer group. To in a prayer group. To in a youth ministry. To in a We have children's program. We have women's program. We are busy. To be busy. <laughs> busy doing what? How much are you, are you doing that is changing the spiritual environment of Entebbe? How 
How much are you doing that is changing the economic landscape of Entebbe? How much are you doing that is changing the family fabric of Entebbe? How much are you doing that is changing the governance of Entebbe? All the social norms. Do you realize it's almost impossible for one congregation to impact the territory? It's almost impossible. And the anointing God puts on you as a minister, powerful as it may be, that anointing on your life is not equal to the principalities and powers and the government of darkness over the territory. That is why let them be one. Let them be one. The Bible says, if you are the eye, is the whole body an eye? If you are the ear, is the whole body an ear? So you may be very anointed in a certain area, but is that all the body needs? Now, if you believe God took you to Entebbe, because he wants Entebbe to be discipled. Have you ever thought why he brought pastor so and so also into Entebbe? And the other pastor also? And the other church? And the other fellowship? They are all in Entebbe. You believe you are in Entebbe for the discipling of Entebbe. Have you ever thought that they could also be in Entebbe for the same? And if you are in Entebbe and you have no cooperation, no working together with them, will you ever finish? Now, that's a scary question I'm asking you. You are in your territory. You don't do things together with other pastors. Your ministry does not join hands with other ministries. I ask you, will you ever finish? And to answer that question, say, what is my impact on this society? What is my impact? And maybe, yes, you have an impact. Is that impact growing? If it's not growing, will you ever take the whole city? The answer is, most probably not. Until you recognize that all these other men of God in Entebbe are not accidental. They are there by God's design. Amen. So all these other churches are not accidental. They are not here to compete with me. They are here to compliment me. They are here that we together we may form the full stature of Jesus. If I am the hand, another is the foot, another is the ear, another is the nose. We need one another. 
The sooner we can join hands, the sooner the full stature of Jesus will begin to manifest. And the devil will know it. That's why the devil hates true unity of purpose. That's why every time we are just tearing each other apart. What did Jesus pray? That they may be one. That the world may believe. So what do you expect the devil to do? Tear us apart, tear us apart, tear us apart. To reach a point where you say, I will never sit on the same table with that pastor. And the question, which spirit are you acting out of? So, let us imagine that you get this revelation that we need one another. I must reach out to all the different pastors and ministers and churches in my territory. And you know when you start reaching out to them, they are not easy. They are not easy. Some are offensive. But did God tell you to love the easy? Did he love you because you were easy? When you are still his enemy, he loved you. So he is not asking you to love the easy ones. He said, as my father loved me, so have I loved you. Go and love one another as I have loved you. Even me, see, I'm not easy. <laughs> But the man just loves me like that. Amina. Nange siri muangu na yomsa jasmani ruache anemera ko. I'm also not easy, but I don't know what Jesus wants from me. Now we remera kuba antube. You also insist on his people. Remera kuba antube. Remera kuba where is Zabi? So he insists on his ministers. In Romans, the Bible says, Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his master, he will stand or he will fall. But he will stand because the master is able to make him stand. Ne, do you know how much we judge each other? One another? And because of that, I can never work with him. Why? Because he's like this. And you wonder whether we are perfect. Love covers a lot of sins. Love endures. Love is patient. But if we agree that we are going to come together. Pastor Godfrey was telling us the pastors in Katale started coming together. Is that perfection? No. And every time you come together, you may live offended. Pray and say, Lord, give me the grace to forgive and to love again. But as you begin to recognize that you need one another, 
God begins to work and melt you and gel you together. I remember the transformation video of Colombia, Cali, Colombia. The pastor was so fighting for unity. And then something happened. Some pastors did things and he was offended. And he withdrew from the unity. He went back home and said, I'm done. I'm done. And the Lord came to him and said, you have no right to be offended. And he said, Lord, what do I do? He said, go back and apologize. Because you are breaking the unity of the body. And said, but Lord, what if they do it again and again and again? The Lord told him, I'm going to overcome it. But you have to give me your life. That's the price. And Ulio said, I give you my life. And a few days later, a gunman shot him. And he died. But in his funeral, all the pastors came together. And they talked about how Ulio was fighting for unity. How they resisted him. And they repented. And they said the only thing we can do before God, let us fulfill what Ulio started. And that's when revival in Kali started. Are you still with me? Ask your neighbor, are you a pastor? Simon, you're a church leader. Okay. Now, when you start on genuine unity of purpose, not unity of character, unity of just uniformity, it's purpose. Why are we coming together? We are coming together because we believe God brought all of us into Entebbe that Entebbe may be brought into the kingdom of God. What makes us one is not being like one another. What makes us one is this. God picked you from where you were, picked me from where I was, picked her from where she was, brought all of us to Entebbe. Because he wants to do something in Entebbe. For the sake of his purposes, in Entebbe, we are one. We are one. Because he deserves the glory. Now we can begin to ask some of those questions that Pastor Godfrey mentioned earlier. is in the control of the darkness. Okay. 
Kale. How do we take over Entebbe? Entebbe tumuangude tutia. Tutandikidewa. Where do we begin from? Number one. It's so kale. Bwemanga Yesu anatuala Entebbe. If Jesus will take over Entebbe. He has an army. Alineje. He has an army he's going to use to fight for Entebbe. What is that army? Is it my church? Alone? Is it my ministry? Is it my denomination? Is that the army of God? But God, Jesus told us in John chapter 10, I have got other sheep who are not part of this flock. I have got to go for them also. And yet most of us just think if anybody does not worship like we worship, he's not of God. If he's not of my denomination, he's not of God. And you think you're going to finish with honor? The only way to finish is when every part of the body brings its own. And we form the full stature of Jesus Christ. As long as you choose immaturity of sectarianism, and operating in sex. You may feel good for 20, 30, 40 years. But there will be no impact on the territory. Am I right? Haven't you seen some churches in that land? I remember I used to go to Western Uganda before I started WTM. I was serving under Maurice Cellulo Ministries. And I met, recent, there are some pastors I worked with. Recently I saw one of them. And he was very, very old. I thought, eh! What happened? Then I thought, how many years was it since I, I worked with him? It's more than 38 years ago. I said, oh, even me, I must have grown older. 38 years is not a short time. But what about those... Are you impacting the land? Are you causing the kingdom to come? I want to get one day, Pastor Godfrey, that we sit with pastors of Katale, Greater Katale. I want to sit especially with those who have been around for the last 30 years. Let us look at Katale and track the changes that have come in Katale. I remember when Pastor Mark Daniel, some of you know Pastor Mark Daniel, we used to come here and Mark Daniel said to me one day, I wish you could pray to that God who has done so much in Uganda that he may also cause the roads to be made. Because he was feeling pain all over. Now recently I was just driving from Entebbe I branched off just after Kajansi. And as I came towards that new roundabout, I thought, 
God, you answer prayer. God, you answer prayer. When we came, first came to this territory, there was no even road coming up to the mountain. Those who came, we used to pass the other side. And sometimes we would slide, you climb up and slide back. Now I look at this Katari area with tarmac roads, with the roundabouts. You pass this way, you find even street lights. Does this God answer prayer? When we came here, we did our spiritual mapping. Jane, you are one of those who are here. Let me see anyone here else was here. Yes, you were here, you were here. These were here when we did our spiritual mapping. 20 years ago. And this territory had no hospitals. No medical centers. The only medical center was at the main road. And it was a small drug shop. There was one school. That one which you, when you, you are going to Nevalami Mayanja. The houses were tired and leaning. Our people went inside and asked questions. Do you have beddings and blankets? And the moms would say, no. This is my gomesi. In the night it becomes this bed sheet. I mean, the poverty around here and the hopelessness. We documented some of those things. I mean, I know we have lost some records, but we have at least some records. And when we came back, we said, Lord, will you let your kingdom come? Change this territory. Now I regret. We just read, let your kingdom come. Change, change. And the change came. Nowadays, there's a time I was driving on that tarmac road. And there was traffic jam. Traffic jam. Traffic jam in Katale. Oh my God. Glory, glory to you. Lord. That was unheard of. Even down there, there were just like two, three shops only. Small, small shops like this. Now you drive through and you see the neon lights. I asked Pastor Godfrey, how many churches are in the Greater Katali? Tell us about how many. Six and above. One of the reports I got was there are almost a hundred. When we came, first came here, I don't think there were ten churches around. I can still remember the pastors I saw in those days who welcomed us. So today he talked about the whole greater Catalyst has got 130,000 residents. But of the 130,000 residents, 16,000 are born again. How many are not born again? More than 11 or 11,400. Hmm? 100 and 
11,000. So when 111,000 are out there waiting for to receive Jesus, why would you tell these 20 people you have, 40, don't go there? Why don't you equip them like the Bible says to go out and bring the harvest? So in, in the Great Commission, we need to be able to say, fine, 11, 111,000 are out there. Inside we have only 16,000. Of, of the 16,000, how many denominations do we have? Maybe we have six, seven, eight denominations. And we, are, we spend some of our preaching attacking the other denomination and attacking the other denomination. You ask yourself, what do you gain? Why don't you instead come together as a people called by the name of the Lord? And you are going to say, ah, for those, they, they worship pictures, idols, and icons. Okay, okay. Let me tell you something. Without judging one another, let us answer one question. What, does, what is it that needs to happen for each congregation to reach the cutting edge of revival? Once you ask that question, you are going to ask, find there is no single church that does not need work. When we get to that point, you will Even the most tongue-speaking needs revival. Even where there are signs and wonders, you are going to see there is a need for certain areas of revival. So don't judge one another how much the others need. Oh, those are so sick. For, for us, we are a little bit sick, but those are very sick. We are all sick. Let us all look for the the doctor. Let us pray for each other. Let us help one another. If they have been living in immorality, don't judge them. Pray for them. Fast for them. Fight their battles. You are going to start seeing change in their congregation. If they have been worshipping icons, don't judge them. Pray for them. Fight their battles. I remember it was Jen. She came with her friend who was staunch Catholic to Watoto. Hell's flames and heaven's gates. Heaven's gates and hell's flames. The sister got saved. Sister Yarokoka. Then Jane came and told me. Jane in Ajananga. I thought she had got saved. But I went home and she's still praying the rosary. How do I confront her? And I said, Jane. Are you the one who saved her? She said, no. Who saved her? Jesus. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Say, keep talking to Jesus. About her. Keep believing the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't confront her. Love her. If she asks, answer her truthfully. 
But don't judge her. It did not take six months, did it? The sister began to come. Sister Jane, what do you think of the rosary? What do you think of Hail Mary in my room? You know God is at work. By the way, where is she? Is she here? Come, 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 come. come. Yeah, come, come. come, come. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Her name is Goretti. I Goretti. What George Praise the Lord. Amen. The Lord is good. And all the time, as I stand here, I can't even start explaining how I came to be with the Lord. And I thank Apostle John Mlinde for not being afraid to come to the Catholic Church. There was a time, Pastor Jane used to tell me, she used to bring tapes that we were preaching. And I loved the messages that were on the, those tapes. I would listen to them. There is a certain tape which I listened to. And the message was, seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord while he's still able to be found. And I said, yes. So now I have to go to mass every day. Because that's what I knew. That's what I knew. So in the morning, I would be the first one in church. In the Catholic church. If I was in Kampala, I would go to the church. Everywhere, I put on by those expensive rosaries and I put them on. And I thought that was how I was going to seek the Lord. Jane used to read the Bible to me. And I would confront her and say, no, because there are things I had grown up knowing that we are the truth. So whenever she talked to me, I would challenge her. But in the Catholic way, and I knew it was truth. But what I did secretly, I went and looked for a Bible. So behind her back, I would go and read and find that what she had told me was the truth. But still I had that zeal. I had that zeal. Then when I felt that what the messages that I had heard and what Jane was telling me was the truth, I prayed a simple prayer. I said, Lord, those messages I'm hearing are good. But if it is the truth, let Apostle John Mininde come to the Catholic Church. If he stands there at the altar, with the reverend fathers there and the sisters with their veils and he gives us a message in the church that is the day I will give my life to the Lord. I thank you, Apostle, you came. Thank you. Hallelujah. The Lord answered my prayer. One day he came. And when he came, he talked about the covenant. And on that day, to give. And by the way, he didn't say yes. 
He didn't even preach, he talked about Jesus. He used the very term that we use. In the language I could understand. And when when I came, I said, yes, I'm giving my life to Yezu. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give a hand clap to Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's not about winning the battle of arguments. It's about that day when we shall stand before him. You know, I could go on and on and on and on. But I remember I was in France. And they invited me in a seminary. All of them were Catholics. And I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you that I can go and share your love with my brethren. And I was with them for two days and shared the word of God. I didn't make an altar call. I just preached. First day went. Second day by lunchtime. One of them came and said to me, everything you have preached, we have to repent. How can we be sure we can stay in the true repentance and not go back? And I said, well, there is something called being born again. And said, what is that? And we began to share about being born again. And he said, can we also be born again? I I remember before I gave my life to the Lord, during the war of Obote and Museveni, my sister sent me to take her children to Mukono, to her brother-in-law. They were born again. There was love in their home. There was a sweetness in the air. I felt so different. And I spent only one night there. I came back and I said to my sister, said, Betty, you know, if we were not Catholics, I would have come back born again. I have never felt so much love, so much sweetness, so much truth. And then Betty asked me, so why don't you, why, why didn't you get saved? She said, because we are Catholics. So when I was in France, I told them, yes, you can be born again. And I had the joy of leading about 200 seminarians to Jesus Christ. 200 seminarians raise their hands, put their hand on their on their hand on the heart and confess the sinner's prayer. Who will take that joy from me? Amen. Amen. My sister, has Rose gone? Rose Rose in Simbi. She has gone. 
I went to Nebi with Rose, my sister, and my brother-in-law, Stephen Chamagwa. We went to the Pentecostal church. The, the people who welcomed us were Anglicans. But we asked them, where is the Pentecostal church here? And it was four miles away. And we walked to the Pentecostal church so that we can do our meetings with the Pentecostals. Unfortunately, when we got there, we learned. Pastor had two wives. And other things. I don't have to tell you everything. And we sat with Pastor said, is it true? He said, yes. God gave them to me. I don't know how, what do, I, what do you want me to do? He said, okay. Now, can we solve this matter? So that we do the meetings when there are no offenses. Pastor refused. And we went back sad. When we reached home, he said, how was it? Where you went to the pastor? And we told them. They said, for us we know. But we said, let us wait until you come back. So they said, what are you going to do? We said, we don't know. Maybe we shall go back to Kampala. Said, back to Kampala? Didn't you come to preach? So why are you not going to preach? Why don't you preach in our church? And we, we said, eh, if you are open, eh, we are here, we are ready. They went and told the lay preacher, lay, lay, lay leader, and he said, I cannot let them preach in the church building. That is against our church order. But this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make our service very short. After that, we go out into the school. Then they can preach to all of us. And we said, Amen. So we went to the church. The service ended very quickly. Then they took us to a quick lunch. Then to the school. And we were with them up to the evening. We made like two sessions. Each session, people gave their lives to the Lord. Then the teacher came and said, that lay leader came and said to us, the lay leader from the other church has asked me, can you also go to his church? He said, yes, yes, yes. He said he's going to gather the people in his home. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we visited three lay leaders. And people gave their lives to the Lord. On Wednesday, when we came back around 10 p.m., the, our host said, I don't know, the catechist, the catechist from the Catholic Church has been here. He said, are you only going to, take, to preach to Anglicans? And they Christians also. Why don't you also go to them? 
And I asked, Will they allow us inside the church building? He said, no, 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 no. He said he's going to make everybody sit in the compound. I said, go tell him we shall come tomorrow. And the next day was Thursday. We went to the Catholic church in the football field. We preached. We made the altar call. Several gave their lives to the Lord. Then we had lunch. After lunch, they said, Can you give us again? <laughs> so we preached again. And I said to the catechist, Is it okay? to make people give their lives to the Lord and we pray in the name of Jesus. And he said, who else is our savior? When we went home, we found a man with an talabus. Said, are you only talking to Christians? Has God rejected us, the Muslims? I said, let us sit down and talk. We can come and talk to you, your people, on two conditions. One, we are going to talk as children of Abraham. And I think you are also children of Abraham, isn't it? He said, yes, yes. I said, two. We speak in the name of Jesus and no any other name. Is that okay? Said, no problem. The next day we went to his home. All the Muslims went to the mosque. After the mosque, they came to the home of the Sheikh. And he said to me, say whatever you want to say. Preach however you want to preach. But don't make an altar call. But ask the people, tell the people you are willing to pray for them. And I'm going to encourage them. Whoever wants private prayer, go and meet the pastor there. When they come, lead them to Jesus. I said, Mualim. Is it okay? If they want to believe Jesus, let them believe. So we preached. And we talked about God calling Abraham. His promises to Abraham. And the seed of Abraham. Jesus Christ. And what Jesus brought into the world. Salvation. And at the end of the day, I said, you know, in Jesus, there is healing, there is forgiveness, there is cleansing, there is peace. So if you want any of these, we are going to sit there near, I mean, in the, in the banana plantation. You can come and meet us there. And we went into the banana plantation. That's where they served us food. As we were still eating, people began to come. And they sat there looking at us. Then the Mualim stood up and said, whoever needs prayer for healing, 
for peace of mind. And anything you want to ask the preacher. The people came. At first we were praying one on one. And the crowd was growing. And growing. In the end I said okay. I'm going to pray for you. For healing. But before healing. How many would like to give their lives to Jesus? And they raise their hand. <laughs> Let me tell you the truth. Looking at them, tears flowed down my, tea, my cheeks. And I said, Lord, how many times have we missed opportunities like this? Because of biases in our minds. It's not me who saves. All I have to do is to lead them to Jesus. The rest is his work to do. And we led them to the Lord. We stayed with them. We rejoiced. We taught them songs until around 10 p.m. Then they walked with us to go back like two miles to where we were staying. And we went singing singing and dancing. Muslims singing Jesus. Unfortunately, Saturday we had to come back to Kampala. So in the next day we left. But for many, many months we used to hear from them. And they were still in Christ Jesus. Come on, give the glory to Jesus. Now, <coughs> let me tell you something. Bishop Musoke. Bishop Musoke. We have been praying here since I came to meet with the, past, the bishops and pastors there. And this is what the Lord has put on our hearts. Now starting with the month of March, every week, we want to be in Kampala. In, in the different divisions of Kampala. And we want to be meeting with pastors to talk about Go nations. If you will allow us, sir. <laughs> <laughs>
Every day you step out of your house is an opportunity to win souls. Every day you should ask for your soul. God, give me my soul for today. The day you don't get a soul, come home and cry. Tell the Lord, woe unto me. And a day has gone by without me winning a soul to the kingdom. Pray extra that night. Cry for the grace. And in the next day, ask for double portion. Let there be a hunger for souls. Tell me, tell me one thing that heaven rejoices when it happens. Except one sinner coming to the Lord. Jesus is the one who told us, the one who knows heaven. He says, when one sinner comes to the Lord, all heaven celebrates and they feast. What else does heaven value like it values the salvation of a person? So we are going to spend February training as many as have that desire. March, we are meeting the pastors all over Kampala. April, we'll be in Singapore and we will be trying to reach out to the as much of Asia as we can. Pastor Lichu, I don't know whether that's an opportune time for Malaysia. Where are you? Where are you? Uh -huh. <laughs> Amen. But there are people here praying for Malaysia. We are praying for all the other countries around in the region. May, I plan to be in the United States of America doing a tour of the USA. Same burden. June, we're going to be in Europe. In Germany. Germany. In Sweden, in Norway, in UK, and our, our cry is, Lord, raise up an army. Raise up a people that will go out relentlessly to win nations to the kingdom. July, we are probably going to be in Israel. Putting finishing touches to the preparation for the launch of Go Nations. And then we shall come back here and launch a fast. August, September, October. Cry out to God. We know that's not a joke to believe that people come from every nation of the world to Israel for God nations. Amen. Amen. How many people believe that can believe God with us? Amen. Amen. And I would like to say, when we started missions in Africa, I, I had my ministry team, but we invited anybody who wants to pray and even to go with us. Are there people here from Eldoret? Oh yeah, Eldoret. 
Are there any Ugandans here who have ever been to Eldoret with us? Can I see your hands? Amen. We just made it open. Let's go. Whoever feels the urge, let's go to Eldoret. I remember in 1997, after conference of three days, on the fourth day we had a Jesus march. And I had never dared to believe for so many people to gather together. And we marched through Eldoret. All over this town. And we finished at the AI, is it, what do you call it? AIC Church. We did a crusade. And people gave their lives to the Lord Jesus. But later on we heard the Freemasons in Eldoret that night they fled. They couldn't stay in the city. Cultists in that in Eldoret that night they fled. We didn't know what we were doing. But God was releasing fire into the city. <laughs> Even the woman who hosted us in her home, we didn't know she was part of some kind of secret society. She opened her heart to Jesus. But when her husband came back, after we had left Eldoret, he couldn't stay in the house. Say the house was full of fire. So he went to Nairobi for many, many, many months. But now, if we only we knew the power we have in Christ Jesus, we would not even rest. We would go out. Now, let me finish with this. I have here a card. The card says the John Mulinde Global Partnership. It's nothing but an, an invitation. Can we partner together for the preaching of the gospel? Where? In Uganda? Yes, if you are in Uganda. Otherwise, where, wherever you come from. Can we hold hands? Can we encourage one another? Can we equip one another? Train one another? And facilitate one another? Everyone, wherever the Lord has put you. Let's go. Let's go preach the gospel. The gospel is the power of God for the transforming of all who believe. It is the good news. And it is what changes nations. Amen. Now, when we were designing this card, do I have can I have this on the screen, please? It has got three sections. First section, it says, Our promise to you. Go Nations promise to you if you become a partner with Go Nations. Number one. Now, unfortunately, my eyes are not that sharp. So let me use my electronic copy. And ushers, please take around those, these cards. But ushers, you used to be many. Where are you? Please give around those cards. Let me just read you what it says. 
you are hereby invited to support the pioneering of Go Nations to awaken, equip, and coordinate the body of Christ to pursue together the completion of the Great Commission. Amen? Amen. JMGP, which is the John Melinda Global Partnership, is a global partnership of, of like-minded people promoting the finishing of the Great Commission in this generation. This is our promise to you. We will train you to pursue and accomplish your personal destiny in God. Number two, we shall provide you with online fellowship and equipping anywhere you are in the world. Number three, we shall provide you with continuous updates of what God is doing around the world under God nations. Those are our three promises. And this is the obligation that we expect from you. If you were to say, I want to be a partner, Number one, commit to pray every day for the work of God nations around the world. This is a commitment between you and God. Brother John will not be looking over your shoulder to make sure that you are fulfilling it. But I want to assure you, when we put God first, God puts us first. It's the law of reciprocity. Two, commit to contribute a minimum of three U.S. dollars per month towards the work of the gospel. Now, this, this, this card was designed for Uganda. Amen. And not everybody in Uganda is at that level. But there are places where you go in the rural areas where a person does not even get one dollar a day. And that's why you see that figure there. Three dollars a month. And I remember when we first started to do this, we went to Gulu in the war-torn territory. And we had a meeting with, there, were, there was a meeting for pastors and then a bigger conference. When I got there, I just felt I wanted to stay with the pastors. So the other the missionaries went to be with the, the rest. And I stayed with them for three days. But on the last day, we talked about the partnership. And there were about 250 pastors. And almost all of them made a commitment to contribute three dollars. That is 10,000 Uganda shillings. Now, there's one mistake I did. We were just taking it under general partnership. And uh, we came from Gulu. I went to the west of Uganda and very soon it was a month. And the pastors were sending messages to our office. Where do we send the money? How do we 
make our contributions. And I regret to say this, but our office failed in this responsibility. There was no prompt response. Some pastors began to complain. You asked us to make this commitment. Now we want to earn our commitment to God, but you are not responding to us. <coughs> and a lot of them fell away. So this time, I say to my leaders, this is not just going to be general partnership with WTN. This is very specialized partnership for Go Nations. I'm putting, I've put together a literally new team that's going to be managing this. And their work is primarily that. Pastor Sylvia, you were with me in Gulu. You testified what I'm sharing? Amen. Amen. Hmm? So we don't want to repeat that kind of mistake. We want to be able to fulfill whatever we promise. And we expect you to fulfill your obligations. I have only read two of the obligations. The other two are commit to participate in Go Nation programs, activities, and trainings around the world. Fourth, pursue the fulfillment of God's destiny for your family, for your city, and your nation. My invitation to you is please join me to pioneer Go Nations into all the nations of the world through your financial contributions and participation in Go Nations. Together we will be a global movement pursuing the completion of the Great Commission within our generation. And then there are two scriptures that I will leave you to read for yourself. After that, now, where we put the three dollars or the 10,000 Uganda shillings, we also put all and we left the space open. If the Spirit of the Lord moves your heart to make any other commitment other than the three dollars a month. For example, just before I came down, Pastor Godfrey came with somebody to my office and he felt the Lord has put it on my heart, I want to contribute to this work every month. <coughs> and he said, I feel in my spirit, I want to contribute three million shillings every month. Now, that is almost like 800 US dollars. Oh, is it 800? Like 400. Dollar. Mm -hmm. Or 350. Now, that is what the Lord's put on his heart. And I had not said anything to him about partnership. So, I believe this is the work of God. And he will put on, on his people's hearts what he so desires. Hallelujah.